Andrew's perspective. If I had to choose a single word with which to describe the escorts awaiting us outside, it'd be thorough. Before the three of us even overstepped the compound's threshold, we were greeted by a small battalion of decorated guards. Vavi visibly shriveled away as one of them approached her, and through some mechanism of instinct, I found myself stepping forth to back her up. Tell it to wear this, the guard demanded, thrusting into Vavi Claws a bundle of black cloth and gesturing toward me with a flippant flap of the arm. Mildly uncomfortable as I was to be called an it, I nevertheless complied when Vavi gently placed the outfit in my arms. Could you please put these on? She asked, her gentle and soothing voice in stark contrast with that of the soldier glaring me down. The outfit provided resembled to some degree a plague doctor's garb, with a flowy black robe concealing my features. The main difference, however, was in its mask. Unlike the more avian visage of a medieval medic, the leather covering provided looked more like a muzzle meant to silence Kafel criminals by forcing their snout shut beneath its tight mold. Obviously, this was no problem for someone with a more human facial plan. And so I concluded that this mask was more meant to conceal my alien nature than anything else. My theory was seemingly confirmed when I put on the mask only to find a web of stiff foam holding up the snout. Clearly, this mask was either modified or created just for me. Immediately upon my equipping of the mask, a cordon of soldiers surrounded my companions and I, forming a protective barrier as they herded us outside toward our vehicular escort, which, save for its utter lack of side windows, largely resembled a limousine. Road trip, I exclaimed jokingly, tucking myself into the furthest back seat and gesturing for Vavi to join me there. I see my request for air transport was denied, Chot sighed, taking a seat near the front so as to better speak with the driver. Did Salkim provide any explanation as to why? Sir, it was too conspicuous, sir, replied the ferryman, seemingly satisfying the head diplomat with his professional demeanor. The journey from here to the prototype lab is seven segments. After that, Goldnest is only a day or so away. Sounds like we'll be in here a while. I shrugged, leaning back and placing my hands behind my head as I looked up pensively toward the vehicle's gray ceiling. Vavi, quick to try and cheer me up, was the next Kafel among us to speak. Good news is they've got magazines in here, she began, quickly sifting through a selection of articles stacked onto the mini table in the middle of our moving lounge. This one's about you, she continued gleefully, holding up a booklet with the title Aliens on Arkisa. Amusing as I found the title itself, I was by this point rather disinterested in reading more about my own arrival. Ultimately, I resolved to leaf through it later, focusing instead on other distractions for the moment. Does this thing have a radio? I asked one of the soldiers seated across from us. It should, they replied, glancing toward the driver for confirmation. Music? The chauffeur asked reaching for a small box embedded into the vehicle's dashboard and pressing a few buttons to conjure from it a tirade of Zintrish song. Up until this point, I wasn't aware that chirps and coos could rhyme, yet clearly whoever sung this song had managed it. Beautiful as the music itself was, hearing my earpiece's attempts to translate at the same time was already giving me a headache seconds in. Naturally, I didn't want to just take it off, as that would limit my ability to communicate, but without music in my own language, my options were somewhat limited to either that of a trip laden with awkward silence. Then I got an idea. Cleo, I began, pressing a button on my earpiece meant to signal the AI. Yes, the smooth voice replied with a questioning lilt, something her original programmers likely worked hard to add in. My Kafel co-passengers looked at me with confusion as I continued into my earpiece, speaking with the virtual entity fortunately still linked to my ship's computer. Are you able to access my playlist? I asked, noting well the curiosity seeping into Vavi's posture as she listened in on my conversation. Who's he talking to? One of the soldiers asked, visibly uneasy with my correspondence. Vavi, always the advocate for my alien nonsense, was fortunately quick to reply. He's talking to the artificial intelligence on his ship's computer. It's what allows him to understand our speech. Technically, I am what is known as a VI, Cleo interjected through the small speaker on my earpiece's far side. 
My sapient score is approximately 0.86. For reference, humans like Andrew usually range from 1.00 to 1.20. I am not truly self-aware per se, but I am able to replicate sapience with an 86% accuracy. Uh, what she said? I chuckled awkwardly to the now dumbfounded soldiers, all of whom looked a mixture of curious and terrified by the implications of a computer replicating a person, an innocence I actually quite missed within myself. Once again, Vavi the ever-curious was next to reply. Miss Cleo, you said something about a sapient score? She began curiously, producing her notepad and placing a pen idly upon it in preparation to jot down information. Could you explain what that means? Of course, Miss Vavi. The Intelligent Sapience Index, or ISI, is a way of measuring how close to true sapience an artificial intelligence is. Andrew's interactions with your species place them at an average of 1.13 on this scale. The highest ISI score ever achieved was ironically a SETI search program meant to sift through radio signals in search of extraterrestrial intelligence. This miraculous score of 1.79 was so intense that this AI, colloquially referenced as curiosity in honor of a planet-exploring rover, actually showed signs of existential dread and even depression in the months prior to its unexplained shutdown. Um, Cleo? I interjected awkwardly, repeating my initial question to the VI regarding whether or not it could potentially pull up my musical selection. Yes, Andrew, I am able to access your playlist. Why do you ask? Excuse me for a moment. Briefly taking my finger off the signaling button, I gestured for one of the soldiers to get our driver's attention. Stopping at a purple light, the chauffeur turned around for a moment to face me. Need something, mister? Alien, sir? Would you mind putting the radio on an unused frequency for me? I asked, prompting our driver to spin the radio's dial over until its nausea-inducing music faded into mere white noise static. Excellent. What frequency is that? Pressing down on Cleo's communication button, I waited for a moment as our driver listed out the unused frequency before then continuing my inquiry. Cleo, could you please broadcast my playlist on that frequency? Of course, the VI chimed, taking advantage of my ship's broadcasting equipment to complete my request. Almost instantaneously, the radio's white noise faded away and was replaced by a tune the familiarity of which heavily juxtaposed my current surroundings. Ever since I graduated from middle school, my favorite songs usually involved space to some degree. The void between stars fascinated me to no end, and frequently on clearer nights I would look up at the night sky and marvel at the vastness to which my eyes were privy. Thinking back to those days as I sat inside an alien transport on the way to meet their prime minister admittedly made me chuckle a bit. Feels like a lifetime ago. Probably because it was... Vavi and the soldiers accompanying us, meanwhile, bore a variety of reactions. Much as I loved her inquisitive mind, it was nice to see my Kafel friend putting down her notepad for once, as she listened with rapture to the tunes of 20th century legend David Bowie, by far the most classical piece within my selection. The soldiers' reactions ranged from suspicious to bewildered to awestruck. I didn't understand any of the lyrics. One guard began, tapping his claws against the side of his seat in rhythm with the song's dying fade. But your people have some pretty beautiful music. That was amazing, Vavi sobbed joyously, wiping tears of joy from her face before then finally turning away from the radio to look me in my eyes. Human music is so, so full of emotion. I've never heard a song sung with such vibrancy before. Music has always been a big part of human culture, I explained, appreciating the other passengers' approval regarding my particular selection. We've actually discovered human musical instruments over 50,000 years old. Judging by the Kafel's reaction to such a number, it was clear to me their species held no comparable contemporary to such an artifact. Fascinating, Chot hummed, shaking his head ponderously as he contemplated the staggering figure. Our oldest instrument, the Andarian drum, barely dates back 20,000 of your years, though I'd imagine we've been singing for much longer. Our journey continued for many hours more, all the while bathed the splendor of music centuries old. 
Throughout the trip, Vavi continued in her usual inquisitive reverie, probing my mind with questions regarding human history and culture, all of which I was happy to provide answers to. One of her questions was that regarding our major world wars, the documentary we watched had gone into the more military aspects, but the political and social sectors had remained largely ambiguous throughout the warfare presentation. Needlessly to say, I spent nearly an entire segment expounding upon this subject. Your people are so complex, she chirped, passing me a bottle of water as I stopped to catch my breath. If by that you mean out of our fucking minds, then I concur. I chuckled in reply, gulping down the liquid lifeblood thankfully common in necessity to all organic creatures. As I did so, the music shifted once again to a song by my favorite contemporary band, the 22nd century phenomena, Moon Rock Red. I'll admit, hearing these songs of my old playlist and basking in the memories they conjured did stir up within me a sense of homesickness. Statistics dictated that I would very likely never see my planet again outside of a screen, and even if I did, it'd probably be ever more alien than this one after so long spent aimlessly adrift in space. Once this war was over, however, perhaps I could finally get started in seeing Arkisa as my new home. Lulled to rest in the back of our transport by the tunes of old human music, Earth prominently featured within my dreams that night. In the most memorable of said visions, me and Vavi were enjoying a good meal together at my favorite restaurant back home. As was true with all dreams, the details grew fuzzy once it was over. For some reason, however, the memory of my Kafel friend's order was one that stuck with me. Mainly imagined, because of how bizarre it was. Who the hell orders pancakes at a steakhouse? I vividly remember asking her. Before Vavi's dream iteration could answer this query, however, the sudden jolt of our transport as it came to halt roused me from my slumber. Could you please wake it up, Miss Vavi? My earpiece hummed in a deep human voice previously attributed to the soldiers. It has a name, you know, I murmured in solid zintrish. Obviously not word for word perfect, but close enough to leave some of the soldiers rattled as I opened my eyes and sat up within the seat I'd fallen asleep in to toss him a glare. My name is Andrew, and I can fully understand what you're saying. Mirthful clicking resonated from the throats of a few other guards as the guilty party visibly recoiled in shock from this revelation. I will admit that my frustrations here were slightly exaggerated, as I could easily imagine myself making a similar mistake in his situation. That being said, messing with people, alien or not, was a guilty pleasure of mine, one that I happily indulged whenever the opportunity to do so without consequence presented itself. You were murmuring in your sleep, Vavi chirped softly, immediately snapping me from my false intimidation as I turned to regard her with an awkward laugh. Please tell me I didn't say anything stupid. The fact that I vaguely remembered the word cloaca showing up in there definitely did not bode well for me. You were rambling on about me and pancakes, she continued, prompting a sigh of relief from me. What is a pancake? a sugary foodstuff enjoyed often by humans for the first meal of our day. I explained, ultimately determining no further detail to be necessary, mainly because I was unsure how they would react to the idea of humans eating the eggs of non-sapient animals. Surely, given their nutrient-rich nature and the Kafel's evolutionary history as opportunistic omnivores, such a thing would be understandable. That being said, I felt at the time like a vehicle full of armed military personnel was not the ideal place to test that hypothesis. Nevertheless, hearing what she did about my dream's contents, a moat of sadness appeared to flicker across the Kaffel biologist's demeanor as she regarded me anew with a look of concern. Yearning for the nest of Earth? she asked, Chot quickly cutting in to inform me of her metaphor's meaning, something akin to homesick. It must be rather disquieting to wake up centuries in the future and on an alien planet. Hope it's not a flight risk. I heard one of the soldiers growl under his breath. Casting a glance across from me, I discovered the source of this comment to be the same guard from before, the one who now seemed to be calling me it, just to piss me off. Oh, police, I snarked, shaking my head in response to this ridiculous comment as I shot another distinctly more serious glare at the soldier, removing my mask so as to force him to look me in the eyes. 
even if I somehow did desire to desert you, which I do not, where the hell would I go? Providence is as likely to take me prisoner as sacrifice me, and I still haven't figured out what caused my ship's thrusters to fail. Interrupting our brief verbal altercation with the Caffel equivalent of clearing one's throat, Chot was the next among us to speak. Lieutenant Kirak, could you please stop bothering Andrew? He began, absolutely demanding the soldier's compliance in all but phrasing. He has been nothing save for cooperative since landing here, and is atop that priceless to our battle against Providence. Well, forgive me if I don't quite trust it, the soldier hissed sarcastically, seemingly surprising Chot with his clear violation of their evident hierarchy. Perfect solutions don't just fall out of space. How can we be so sure he's not just trying to scout for an invasion or something? Placing a claw upon my shoulder seemingly to comfort my growing unease, Vavi met this suspicion with more verbal aggression than even I had planned to. That's ridiculous, she nearly screeched, her feathers puffing out slightly in a gesture admittedly somewhat frightening to me. If that was the case, why would he be giving us weaponry stronger than what we've already got? With all due respect, ma'am, the lieutenant continued, assuring us all that his continuing tirade would surely be anything but. Do you really think the weapons he's giving us would be even close to effective against a battalion of humans? What if he's helping us take down the Temenian so that once they invade, the larger force is already dealt with? Kirak! The Kafel diplomat continued angrily. If you continue antagonizing him, then I can and will be filing it as a sabotage of military property, punishable by court-martial. Property? Vavi spat, mirroring my own discontentment with such a phrase as I myself promptly repeated the exclamation. Regarding us both with a sigh, Chot clarified. Apologies, Andrew, because our constitution does not yet legally qualify humans as people, I am simply deferring to the harshest possible punishment. If it makes you feel any better, your current status as Class 8 research equipment means that your life is technically more valuable than those of everyone else in this vehicle combined. Uh, thanks, I guess, I replied awkwardly, unsure of and frankly not optimistic about how precisely to feel about such a title. What does Class 8 mean? I then continued, hoping to get my mind off of the unpleasantness of this scenario. Equipment importance is scaled from zero to eight, our driver picked up, turning around to regard us from the front seat of our transport, which I now realized was, in fact, within some kind of parking garage. For perspective, the first internal combustion engine prototype was a six. And what kind of equipment is an eight? I asked in English, prompting from Chot himself not a translation, but instead a direct response. Utterly and unequivocally world-changing, he espoused, waving his claws outward in a human-like indication of grandeur I couldn't determine whether was adapted from human culture or simply a matter of odd convergence. You, my friend, are the first Class 8 piece of equipment ever uncovered. Implications aside, that's pretty damn amazing, don't you think? And a mind-sniffing Ketyav is a two. Kirak huffed, staring at the nearby door of our transport as though looking out a non-existent window. So congratulations, you're marginally more important than our battlefield animals. Kirak! Chot growled once more more, this time in unison with Vavi and a few of the less decorated soldiers whom I presumed to be Chirak's underlings. Just stating a fact. The combative Kafel shrugged, nonchalantly investigating his talons in complete and total disregard for the entire vehicle's worth of individuals against him. Our friend doesn't have scales, but I'm sure it's not scaleless enough to be offended by the truth. Right. Andrew? Right, I replied through gritted teeth, not wanting to give this lieutenant the satisfaction of a negative response that may validate his theories of hostility. Admittedly, Placing myself in his lack of shoes, I understood the suspicion. If during World War II, a living, breathing gray showed up to help fight the Axis powers no strings attached, I can imagine many humans reacting similarly. Worst of all, I was almost certain that that exact scenario was on some conspiracy board back on Earth somewhere. Maybe once everyone back home learned about real aliens, all the theories about them will die down in favor of the facts. Yeah, almost certainly not. I'm glad to see you're still smiling, Vavi chirped enthusiastically, grossly misinterpreting my gesture in a way I simply had not the heart to refute. 
Fortunately, before Kirak had opportunity to further infuriate me, our collective conversation was interrupted by a knocking upon the door nearest to me. Temenian's egg is rotten, a voice began from the other side, the nonsensical line seemingly the first piece of some kind of code. Strangely enough, returning the outsider's knock, our driver responded to this prompt with a similarly cryptic verse. And its fumes shall be, be their end. Everyone out, single file, the voice demanded, unlocking my door from the outside and swinging it open to reveal standing there a surprisingly short kafel with red scales and single-pronged ears. You first, Mr. Human. Offering up a compliant nod, I quickly reapplied my kafel mask and with careful steps exited the vehicle per the stranger's commands. Is this a joke? One of the soldiers squawked angrily, leering down at the new arrival with disdain so clear it transcended the borders of species without even requiring a translation, though I was provided one regardless by my earpiece. Who the hell put a red scale in charge of us? The soldier spat, his usage of those two words as a single phrase rather telling. Salkim did, Chot growled, glaring down Kirak's company as though daring another of them to speak up. Teague is a loyal operative recognized by the prime minister himself. Loyal to his next paycheck, maybe? One of the soldiers murmured loudly enough for everyone inside to hear. Kirak, control your men, Chot spat hopping out of the vehicle after me and offering the red scale an affectionate handshake analog. Good to see you again, he then chirped, greeting this Teague as one would an old friend. How have the winds been blowing? Pretty great, actually, Teague replied, returning the friendly gesture. I've got to be the luckiest red scale alive, working as a special operative under the big man. Some of my folks still don't believe it. Curiosity briefly overwhelming my politeness, I determined my question to be one worth interrupting over. Excuse me, I stuttered out in Zintrish, quickly gaining the attention of both Chot and Teague. I wish the other humans back home had been this happy for my input. I have to ask, what's wrong with someone having red scales? Meeting my question with a light huff of indignation clearly directed away from myself, Teague began anew. Only that we're primitive, weak, greedy, and overall inferior. He cawed bitterly, listing the horridly familiar accusations upon his upper talons. At least that what everyone says we are. I assure you, Mr. Alien, sir, we're not nearly as bad as politicians will tell you. Responding to the Caffel's brief rant with nary more than a sad nod, I eventually found it in me to continue the talk. I'm sorry to hear people think that about you, I sighed, seemingly confusing the soldiers as they piled out after Vavi amidst Chot's translation. Back on Earth, things used to be pretty similar. I hope the KFL eventually get better like we humans did. Sorta. I guess it ain't all terrible. The Red Scale sighed, placing his claws professionally behind his back as he straightened out his posture to stand about a head shorter than me. Nobody suspects me of being an undercover agent. Usually they just assume I'm up to no good and leave it at that. I would have appreciated to know about this. I began bluntly, probing Chot for some form of reply. Those cartoons you watched contained a ton of stereotypes. I thought you would, would pick things up on your own. I thought the short ones were silly children, I exclaimed in reply, noting a sad, ironic giggle from Vavi in response to my newfound anguish of having laughed at racist caricatures. Regardless, Teague cooed, holding out his left claw for me to shake. It really is a pleasure to meet you, sir. Likewise, I replied, accepting his gesture with excessive enthusiasm and a careful regard for my own prior evident strength. All right, then, chirped my kafel translator, marching ahead alongside the red scale and gesturing for all of us to follow. The prototype facility is just upstairs. Let's see what the tech boys have concocted, shall we? Following Teague up two flights of stairs, I was surprised to find us almost immediately deposited upon the floor of what almost resembled a factory. Various construction tools laid about surrounding a handful of half-complete whitebirds lined up on what looked to be some form of assembly line, one line out of three, two of which appeared to be left empty. Nearly all of the workers immediately stopped what they were doing upon our arrival. Some of them looked frightened by me at first, presumably rattled by the inclusion of a muzzle in my wardrobe. Their fear, however, very quickly became awe as Chot introduced me. Andrew, 
Would you care to present your new blueprints to these good people? Naturally, I was happy to. Approaching one of the inactive conveyor belts and spreading the blueprint out upon its treads, I waited for everyone to gather around before finally beginning my speech in English, replying on chat to translate. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce to you the first human-designed weapon to ever grace Arkesian soil and soon the battlefields of Zintral's foes, the EK-01.